and welcome to Thrift Shop Biography. This is the one about John Cleese. Thank you for listening. Hello. Hi. So, this week you found the autobiography of John Cleese. Yes, I did. In the thrift shop. How much did you pay, can you remember? Oh, I think it was £3. A nice copy, hard, hardback. I also found Eric Idle at the same time, but we decided John Cleese is more known. Yeah, he is. He's done more by himself. I really, now I really want to read Eric Idle's as well. Do you? I really do, actually. Yeah. Sitting there looking at me all the time. <laughs> so, John Cleese... What did you know about him before you read this book? Uh, Monty Python. I mean, I know basically about him. What I'm a fan of more is Faulty Towers. Of course. Yeah. Uh, how about you? Um, again, Monty Python wasn't even on my radar. Right. And so consequently, I've never really looked into it as an adult or anything. Never been to see Spam a lot the musical. And of course, I'm fully aware of it. Oh, in I the... have. Yes. And I've seen all the films. I've seen the series. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. quite clued up on it. Oh, yeah, I've never seen Life of Brian or what's it called? The Meaning of Life. What's the other one? Yeah, I also had the album. So Did you? I know a few of them sort of pretty much wow. by heart. And I have to say, I quote it to myself every now and then. It's like in my brain, some of the things they oh, say really? are in my brain, yeah. Oh, that's interesting because it's just so far off my radar. Wow. Faulty Towers, of course, loved it. Yeah. But I tell you what, John Cleese did a film in the 1980s called Clockwise. Yeah. I really, really love it. that film. Yeah, oh, it's a brilliant film. But I need to watch that. But Fish Called Wonder. Fish Called was Wonder. Genius. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant. So actually between us, we know quite a lot about yeah, John Yeah, I guess Cleese. we do. I mean, we're English, right? You can't <laughs> not know about John Cleese. He's part yeah. of our fabric of our furniture, isn't he? Yeah, no, absolutely. And he's very, very funny. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, this book, funniest one we've read so far, right? I was regaling a couple of different stories to people during this week <laughs> and I shed tears, like there's tears rolling down my face as I repeated these stories. Yeah. It's really funny, laugh out loud funny, isn't it? Yeah, I, I really yeah. loved it and I really appreciated it after we've read quite a few that haven't been as funny. So this was just like a real yeah. tonic. I have to say, I was anticipating quite a morose man. I thought he was going to be miserable and bitter and moaning. I didn't expect him to have written a comedy book. Mm -hmm. I didn't think that's who he was. I now see him quite differently. I think he does mention, like, his introvertness. Yeah, but I see him as a man who is really, really passionate about writing comedy yeah. and getting it right and the science of it and intelligence of it. And that's his main love. Writing. The, writing comedy. Yeah. I didn't realise he was... I mean, I should have realised. Of course it is. But I thought a book that he would write would be all sorts of other stuff and it isn't. This is a comedian's manual. A real oh, guide. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Shall we get started? Shall we? So, John Cleese was born in 1938 in Western Sea for yeah. Again, how how is Western Sea for Mare so starry and popular? <laughs> I don't know. I grew up quite close to Western Sea for Yeah, Mare. did you know John Cleese was from there? No. I didn't have a clue where he was from. Were you surprised to find out his actual name? I wept. I howled. <laughs> Go on, tell him. Tell him. His real name is John. I mean, I can't believe it. I actually thought it had to be it's a joke. so funny. <laughs> His name's John Cheese. His actual name is John Cheese. <laughs> it's real name. Just, it's genius. Just by the way we're laughing about it, you can understand. <laughs> well, his dad changed it, right? Yeah. Because his dad was annoyed with people laughing. At it. We, yeah. We've literally just laughed about it. Yeah, <laughs> so you kind of would have... If that happened to his dad, every time somebody said to his dad, what's your name? Mr. Cheese. <laughs> yeah. And then people yeah. probably really laughed. Yeah. I totally understand why he changed I mean, it. it's funny-ish if you were a secretary or an accountant. But if you're a comedian called John Cheese, for real, unbelievable. Yeah, I know, actually. He should have reverted back. I understand why his dad, his dad was like a, a law solicitor or something so no i understand why that's a, a comedy an annoying name for him mm. but you're right actually if you, you're having a career in comedy why not be cheese exactly i love his relationship with his dad me too it's lovely and do you know what it's kind of opposite nearly every other book we've read yeah. they all have problems with their dads and their mums are stunned by them but yeah. this is the opposite i know it's the opposite and i just i loved reading it i loved how close he was to his dad i hated of course how what would be the word to describe his mother Nuts. He said that his mum could be charming and bright when they had guests around. Yeah. But when the guests left, says her sociability began to fade 
and he writes this meant that there was nearly always tension in the Cleese household because when mother was not actually angry, it was only because she was not angry yet. Well, that's awful. Yeah, dad and I knew that the slightest thing, almost anything, would set her off. So constant placatory behaviour was the name of the game. So he's treading on eggshells as a little boy. It's definitely formed (laughs) an awkward idea of women. Yes. Possibly to be avoided, because he does avoid them for a long time. Oh, yeah, and he's really awkward around them. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, he's really old when he loses his virginity. Yeah, 25. That's old, right? And that was only a passing stranger, one-off. Just a kind, helpful woman. (laughs) (laughs) It is quite old, isn't it? But it's so weird how women aren't really in his radar. Anyway, he doesn't really go to after-school clubs. He goes home. He's very protected. Plus, he's going to boys' schools, isn't he? Then he gets boys' schools. Then he goes to Cambridge, which is all boys. It's just a boys' world. And then there's a few women in the drama society and stuff. And he doesn't really know how to talk to her. There's one woman in his law class and he's in love with her and he's never even spoken to her. Yeah. But I'm sure that he doesn't know how to talk to women because his only example is this really weirdly aggressive, pent up, anxious yeah. creation. Because at some point his dad said to him, your mother's going to leave tomorrow and your auntie's coming to live with us. And he remembers thinking, oh, that would be so nice. Yeah, right. It'd be so peaceful in the house. My auntie's really nice. And then it never happened and it was never talked about again. So he really wouldn't have minded if his mother moved Yeah, yeah. That's how bad it was. Blimey. Poor little boy. But, you know, thank goodness that his dad was really Such lovely a lovely and man. Nurturing. So yeah. protective. Her, his oh, mum and dad were together a long time before they had him. They 13 were 13 years. And years. they were older anyway. Yeah. Because his dad had gone to the... His dad had lived at home till he was 22 and then signed up for the First World War and then gone to live in Hong Kong and lived like a king for a while with servants and things. Good old colonialism. Job. Yeah. Then he came home because he got malaria. But he was away for five years, so he only okay. got home when he was 27. And his mum was 26. Yeah, it's an odd relationship. The mum, she's very standoffish. She doesn't show affection or humour. No. I think his dad overcompensated for that. And John Cleese says it's because of his dad's affection towards him as a child that set him on the path, what he says, to have a wussy career in (laughs) comedy and entertainment rather than a stereotypically male vocation. Yeah, he does call himself a wuss quite a lot. Yeah, he does, actually. Is that a word that exists in America? Oh, what I don't be? know. What would it be? It's would like it be? weak. Yeah, yeah, like a weakling, yeah. Yeah, a bit pathetic. It's a harsh word to describe yourself, but... Probably coming out of the war as well, where all men went to fight and then be very macho and masculine. And then if you go towards a career in the arts, it probably is considered wussy, actually. Yeah, it would. But before he was even going that way, he just describes himself as this really gangly, skinny... Weak fellow. Yeah, a bit awkward. He is tall, isn't he? He's really tall. He's taller than most of his teachers by the time he's 13. (laughs) And also, because they moved to this farm to escape the bombs, then they moved back, then they moved back to the farm again, then they went down to Devon, back, blah, blah, blah. They were always moving around. He went to eight schools before he was eight. So he was constantly the new boy and getting called Cheese. (laughs) (laughs) I guess he was trying hard to fit in as a gangly, odd, skinny boy who didn't like to fight. But he luckily was good at sports. Yes. Sports must have saved him, I think. Mm-hmm. When he goes to Catholic school at six years old, they ask him an impossible sum on his first day. Then he gets whipped. Oh, it's horrible. Right? But when he goes home, he says to his parents what happened. They pull him out of school straight away. Yeah, and good. put him in a really nice school. And this is the story we should be reading about every single person who gets abused at school because... Their life would be much better. But anyway, this is what he says. And I almost think every single time we read a book where there's a bullying school thing, we need to refer back to this sentence because it just covers it all. He says, It's terrifying how much of this deeply unkind, utterly pointless, in fact, mind-bogglingly counterproductive behaviour was meted out to children over the centuries by half-witted, power-crazed zombies like this heinous old bat... A large proportion of such psychopaths allegedly acting in the name of an all-loving God. Yeah. That just sums it all up. Yeah. It's despicable what happened to so many children. I think it was kind of in our lifetime they stopped physical punishments in school. Yeah. It's just it's an utter disgrace. Yeah. And it has, I think, so many men went through this at school that I actually think 
we're living with the problems of those personalities now, like the people who in the government and stuff. They were all beaten as very yeah, small yeah. children by people in power and authority. Yeah, yeah. Oh, honestly, it makes my blood run cold. And do you know what John Cleese actually says? It wasn't until he started having therapy 25 years later he realised the power of that trauma. Mm. And he said it all came flooding back. Fury, self-pity, humiliation, a deep, deep sense of hurt and pure indignation is not so much the unfairness but the insanity of punishing someone physically for getting an answer wrong. Yeah, and that happened to him once. So wow. imagine the therapy you need when you've gone through five years of that or more. For getting an answer wrong when he was six years old. Yeah, an impossible sum, he said as well. Oh, it's disgusting. Oh, it's so sad. It's sadistic, these yeah. people. I can tell you something, you can leave what? it in or not. When I was at school, they sent a teacher over from the boys' school and he was the end of that era. I feel like I literally just witnessed the end of that era because he'd been in the Second World War. He was quite old. And he just came to teach us one class because there was a teacher missing. And we were late to the class and we had to run because we saw him coming. We had to run to get in just before him. And when we got in and sat down, he came in and went, you two outside. And we got up because I'm a really good kid. I was yeah. never naughty. We stood outside and he yelled so violently at us that I wet myself. Oh, no. Yeah. It was so horrendously aggressive. I can't even... Can you imagine a sergeant major uh, never, no. ever being yelled at or heard that level of oh. anger? It, it just completely and utterly floored me. We'd only just run into the class. How old were you? Hadn't done anything. Uh, 12? Oh, it's really horrible. And that's, that's the sort of thing. So I kind of feel like that's the end of that era because they were dying out. And I think a lot of these people were affected by war. Or... You can only imagine what they would have been through at school 40, 50 and years that, earlier. And yeah. they're all damaged. And, you know, let's hope it is fizzling out. Oh, well, it had to by law. Like it if, did have yeah. to by law. But it's interesting. If that law wasn't passed, there would still be teachers who would yeah. hit children. Yeah, oh, it's just sure so he'd horrible. have loved to have if he had a, was allowed. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, it's of kind of an interesting experience. Did you have therapy? <laughs> no, actually, probably the first time I've ever said it out loud now. Oh, don't rely on me for any therapy. <laughs> it's good to talk. <laughs> anyway, so he went to a nice school and he had a good time. Oh, it's amazing that his mum and dad took him out of that school. Yeah, the yeah second... no, isn't that brilliant? Roald Dahl's mum did that as well, do you remember? Yeah. Okay, there's a few things in the school section that are bloody hilarious. Yeah. He names this kid David Rogers. <laughs> He's sitting next to him at the table. And they've got this teacher who's a really impressive man. In fact, it's his first hero. And he's watching this boy, David Rogers, draw a circle with his compass very carefully. And every time it gets to nearly the finished circle, his compass slips <laughs> and he draws a wiggly line. He goes, oh, and he gets his rubber and he's rubbing it out. Eraser. And then does it really carefully again. And then it slips again. And he does this over and over and he's furiously rubbing it out over and over again. The more he's concentrating, the more it slips every time. And eventually he gets up with this like determined fury that's contained. He's got a pen knife. He goes over to the bin starts sharpening the point of the compass with his penknife in this like, furious but really controlled way. He's sharpening and sharpening this point as if he makes that sharper, it's not going to slip. <laughs> and John Cleese is basically weeping watching this. And in that moment, he realises that what is so funny about anger is when it's repressed and kept in. That's what's funny. And he said he still had that in his mind. I don't know how old he is, probably about eight that's still in his mind when he created the character of Basil Fawlty. Yeah. It's just these things, all these little triggering points all along his early life. Comedy and the craft of it and observation of what makes you laugh and what makes humans ridiculous. Mm -hmm. He's absorbing it all and mm -hmm. keeping it in a little pot in his brain. With Basil Fawlty, it's that whole character is just teetering on the edge of, like, an explosion. Yes. It is just it's completely... keeping it in. That manic grin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say this now? I'm yeah. really disappointed he barely talks about Faulty Towers I in know. this book. I know. I was potentially disappointed until I thought about it, and I realised that it's all in here, the build-up to it, and the characters and the observation and how he creates comedy and how he writes comedy and all of that. 
by the time you actually get to the writing of it, it's just work again, isn't it? His crafting, you can't describe how you craft an episode and then another one or how you filmed it. No, I get that, actually. Now you said it, that kind of does yeah. make sense. But I felt slightly short-changed. I guess it's because it's the one thing that I know and love John Cleese for. I just wanted a few tales from the set. Yes, you know? I know. I'm and gonna... even, and Or even just talking about how successful it was and, and how everyone... Like, loved it. and Yeah, so I'm being positive because I would have liked to read more about that. It was annoying. Let me be honest. It was annoying that he spent the whole first half of the book in his childhood and going to college. And yet he barely wrote anything about 40 Towers. True. Yeah, except that I do take it as the build up to everything. Like Once you've got everything that's the foundation of what you then create, the creation is we can watch it. Yeah, I also wondered if it was like the Bob Dylan book in that Bob Dylan really left out some of what we consider to be his yeah, finest moments. And so I wondered whether John Cleese considers Faulty Towers one of his defining moments. He, it, I don't think he does, otherwise it would be in this book. No, it's it? that weird thing where it was only 12 episodes. Yeah, that's true. Probably just a little thing. He knocked out 12 episodes of half-hour comedy mm-hmm. for telly. It's just so bloody legendary. But it is funny, like you say, that, you know, you can trace it back to an eight-year-old boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. trying to draw a, a gay furious. Yeah. It's absolutely hysterical. Is that, oh, God, it's great. It is. He, there's lots of little stories like this in this book, aren't they? And they're all so yeah. funny. But you can see that it is the total of all these funny little experiences. Yes. Is his comedy Yeah, they're getting mild. filed. Yeah. yeah he's, he's got a comedy brain. And it's, even thinking that he can recall them. I mean, he's probably, yeah. I don't know how old he was when he wrote this, but about 65, 70. Yeah. And he's recalling yeah. these stories from when he was 10. Because they're shaping him. Yeah. It's good, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's very interesting how another child sat in that classroom maybe not have observed those yeah. things at all. That but some John bird Cle- flies by and they become a zoologist. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. yeah, it's just what people pick up and yeah. how they yeah. take it forward and how Process it becomes it useful. Store yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I've been watching comedians in cars getting coffee on Netflix and there's so many of them and you really get an idea of a comedian's brain. It's a completely different brain from every other person. And it is this thing, storing, mm-hmm. observing, getting a bit, making a bit. That's a funny bit. And then expanding that into a... It's so interesting. Mm-hmm. And the surrealism and seeing the world in quite a surrealistic way. It's really cool. Yeah. And especially because John Cleese is first and foremost a comedy writer. Writer, yeah. I mean, I didn't know he saw himself like that because I've seen him acting in all this yeah. stuff. But he absolutely distinctly says none of them, the Pythons, are yeah. actors first. Yeah. They're writers first. Then they just perform their own sketches. Yeah, and he said that's why it kind of worked so well between them, is that when they were writing, there were no ego involved within the writers saying, I want to play this part, I want to play that part. Actually, the parts just got naturally assigned to the people who would be the best type yeah. to play it. And then no one was writing to showcase their talent. Yeah. They were just writing what was the funniest yeah. thing you could write. Yeah, it's cool, that. This book really allows you to see into the process that John Cleese and Graham Chapman write, because they wrote together yeah. for 20 odd Graham years. Graham Chapman's very present in this book, yeah. isn't he? Yeah, it does show you how the writing goes from observation yeah. through to like a finished sketch or yes. something. He's made it very clear how that works. Yeah, I really love getting an idea of that. Because to knock out the amount of comedy they did, you need a lot of inspiration. He ends up at Cambridge, but in between Cambridge and school, there's like a college called Clifton House or yes, something. It's, yeah, it's where he went to school. They, I get a bit confused because he moved around he to schools did, quite a bit. He did, but it's the one okay. with his hero in it. Okay. He, he got into Cambridge, but he had to postpone for two years because... Was it because of all the soldiers from a war? Yeah, so war yeah, queuing to get in. Yeah, so he got accepted into Cambridge, but because of the war, there's a bit of a backlog after the war. Yeah, there was basically. like a two year thing. So they accepted people, but they told them they had to wait yeah. because we need to let the people who've been to war come in first. I think it would have done him a world of good, actually. If he'd have gone straight from school, it might have been yeah. a bit much. Well, he went back to St Peter's School and became a teacher, didn't he? Yeah, he became a teacher at a place where he had been, where he had that hero teacher who yeah. ended up. 
then became his colleague. She's really nice. And it's funny because he didn't think that any of the teachers liked him, but he really, really liked them. Yeah. He really admired all of them. Don't forget this is like 50 years ago and he would have been so much younger. And teachers, even though they were probably like 40, did seem like 65. Yeah. Then. So I imagine the age gap was more pronounced even though these days it wouldn't be but he had a great time there yeah he said he thoroughly loved teaching yeah he sounds like a great teacher he really got through to people he really absorbed their different needs yeah apart from the odd one you just can't get through to at all that's teaching it's really good and he sat with them at lunchtime and he said they particularly loved all his stories of all his pranks and stuff that's really nice i bet he really changed some people's lives in two years i get the idea he did you Yeah, I get that he was really committed and really passionate teacher. I do. do. And he said, because he was teaching geography, he didn't know anything about it. But (laughs) they said, just stay one page ahead, they'll be ten. (laughs) And then one of them in the history class said, Sir, when did Henry VIII die? So he said, oh, hang on a minute, I'll be back. And he ran off into the staff room to look it up. up. (laughs) And then when he came back and told him... The bus said, well, what about this king? And the yeah, family? but then he went home and memorised every single king yeah. and queen's eras and dates. And he said that actually really got him interested in history. <laughs> <laughs> Just talking in terms of comedy and stuff that he yeah. would have seen as a boy. Of course, the TV was only really just getting going. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of comedy on there. And what was there was kind of like the variety shows and yeah. stuff. And there were people like Max Wall and Tommy Cooper, but a lot of it came on the radio. Yeah. He said, on the BBC radio, the greatest radio comedy show of all time, The Goon Show. Yeah. Did you ever listen to that? I know it's yes. not our era, but are you yes, aware of it? Yes, but not a lot. Was that Spike Milligan? It was Peter Sellers. Okay. And Carrie Seacombe was on that as well. Okay, well, that makes sense, because those it's, two it's people they were his turn heroes. up later in the they book. They do. But he really loved that. The way he talks about the Goon Show, he says it was a real, of course, because there was no TV, a real national thing that people would have their dinner at night and then all gather around the radio and really laugh yes. until their sides hurt. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Oh, another thing the Cleese family did as a family, the three of them, was go to the ice skating rink <laughs> and yeah. watch beginners fall over. <laughs> Do you know why I'm so, so pleased you wrote this? Because I think there is nothing funnier than people walking. <laughs> people agree. falling over or people walking into plate glass windows <laughs> and doors. <laughs> is it, it's before those TV shows with the little You've clips of everyone praying. though, isn't it? Yeah. So you actually have to take yourself to watch the live <laughs> people falling over videos. <laughs> But he said they'd sit a discreet distance so it wasn't obvious what they were doing. Imagine him and his older parents just... (laughs) He said it's the only time his mum really left. And they said they had to take her out for a cup of tea afterwards so she could calm down. (laughs) (laughs) I love that because I I really... I want to do that Yeah, let's go. It is unquestionably... It's it's hilarious watching people fall over. So then he left the teaching job in 1960 Hmm. and then he's off to study law at Cambridge. Yeah, just randomly picked law. He's fairly interested in it. Yeah, he said it was either economics or law. Yeah. And he said that his dad said that law ran in the family and then John Cleese figured out (laughs) that it was just his dad referring to his own job as being a solicitor's clerk. (laughs) (laughs) That law runs in the family. (laughs) And it's one he's at Cambridge... Quite early on, you have to sign up for clubs mm. and stuff. That's where he found the Footlights Yeah, which club. is really legendary. I think they probably made it legendary, actually. I think their 1963 review, from the sounds of it, that then got taken on to New York and Broadway run and West End, probably put Footlights really on the map. OK. Because he said after he was there... People used to go to Cambridge just so they could join Footlights. It's surprising how many people have been through yes. Footlights. Yes, yes. Olivia Coleman is Footlights. Really? Yeah. Obviously, people like Mitchell and Webb. Mel and Sue are really? Footlights. I didn't know that. Didn't know that. One of the guys from The Inbetweeners. Oh. I looked them up because I, it piqued my interest to see who else had come yeah. through Footlights. This era of TV, when he goes to work at David Frost, like almost everybody yeah. 
on TV in comedy in the 60s was from Footlights, it yeah, it's seems. True. Yeah, it's And it was a club. real boys' club, actually. Yeah. It's early TV again, so they were the first people in. Yeah. So David Frost was in Footlights, and he was a couple of years above them, and then he used the sketches yeah. material for his TV show and then brought them all in. So yeah. it was him, really, who started it, the connection. Oh, gosh. John Cleese speaks so highly of David yeah. Frost and that he was really invested in people's talents, really opened the door in the industry for so many people. He would he would sometimes take credit for their writing, yeah. but nobody seemed to care yeah. because he'd been so helpful <laughs> yeah. to them and, and then would continue to assist them throughout their careers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sounds like a really... Decent. Decent chap. Yeah. And Miriam Margulies pops up. She's in some of these things. Yeah, she is. She came from the drama department. And That's I right. kind of thought to myself, well, that actually goes to show there weren't any women in the Footlights back in the really day. There really weren't, who were just doing yeah. it for comedy. Emma Thompson was Footlights, actually. Yeah, so the, Emma Thompson, Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, I think they were of the same gang. Anyway, it knocked out some of the best comedy. Oh, oh my God. One of their reviews is directed by this shaggy-haired chap called Trevor Nunn. Yeah, right. Legendary director. Nicholas Heitner is... Um, Footlights. Footlights, yeah. Is he really? Yeah. Wow. So, Everyone. yeah, it bred, it bred talent. It sure did. John Cleese finishes his law degree, passes his exams. Mm. Then he was just going to do the, a show in the summer and then on to begin his law career. But somebody who'd seen the show in the summer offered John Cleese a job to write for the BBC Radio Light Entertainment Department. He'd be a trainee producer writer at £30 a week. So his law career doesn't even get started. No. Even though he studies for years and takes exams, which he found really hard. Yeah. Like, as soon as he graduates, he's offered a job at the BBC. And the law job would have paid £12 a week. Yes. And the dream job pays more than double. Yeah. In no time. Oh, my God. So when the review was picked up, five-month run at the Arts Theatre, mm -hmm. at that point... Oh, then it gets transferred to the Lyric Shaftesbury Avenue. He's then paid £30 a week with £100 a week writing royalties. There you go. That's where the money is, I'm yeah. always told. With another £30 a week from the BBC, he's already being paid triple or whatever his dad ever earned. Yeah. But the thing is, is that his mum and dad don't understand that because it's just such a airy, fairy vocation that yeah. he's doing. He has to convince his mum and dad, no, I'm making more money yeah. than I ever would have done yeah, being a yeah, lawyer because yeah. they don't believe him. They just think he's no. wasting his time yeah. in London doing comedy on stage. <laughs> How is that a career? Exactly. And even after he's been on telly for a few years... And he's doing really well. His dad writes him a letter <laughs> and asks if he would ever consider applying for a job at the personnel department of Marks and Spencer's. <laughs> oh. So he's writing for BBC TV and radio. He says a couple of his first jobs are for existing scripts written by older people and they get John Cleese to weed out the really boring old jokes and to bring it a bit more up to date. The comedy show they had that they put on stage is called The Cambridge Circus, right? Mm. Then they have this radio show called I'm Sorry, I'll Read That Again. And that's a long running success. Yeah. And then he gets more writing jobs for people like Dick Emery and Derek Guiler and stuff on the BBC. Yeah. So he's really this. I didn't realise this about John Cleese is actually he's getting an education at the BBC as a comedy writer. Yeah. Before he's ever really on the screen. And also, the review is in New York. The review, the review show, show is on Broadway. Yeah, that started at Cambridge, 1963. That one. So they travel out to Broadway to put... That's amazing that that even so happened. So cool, isn't it? And the audiences love it. Love it, but it got slated in the New York Times, which has power, so it yeah, shut in course. three weeks. But it got picked up by a smaller supper club, which sounds like they had much more fun there because it was more intimate. Yeah. And they could really enjoy the audience. People out there in the world that saw that, they go... I was there when. Yeah. So he was really living in New York. Yeah. I mean, they were really living there. And he met this waitress. Well, this really surprised me. Go on. Well, because it was his best mate who fancied her. No, but oh. about who the waitress is. Oh, the waitress is Connie Booth. She's in Faulty Towers. She's the uh, chambermaid. What's her name? I can't yeah. remember her name. Polly. Is. Polly. Yeah. I had no idea she was American. Oh, no, nor did I. But she's so English. I didn't know she was American <laughs> at all. She's so English. Yeah. But I kind of, I reread it because when I first read it and they said the waitress was Connie Booth, I thought, oh, what is she doing out yeah. there? She must be a jobbing actress out. In, but she, no, she's actually American. Yeah, I didn't know that either. No idea. No. 
Good acting, Connie Booth. Yeah. You had us fooled. And then I love that John Cleese then says, however, a few days later, for a reason that now escapes me, I went back to the restaurant to have lunch. It's like, oh, the <laughs> yeah. reason you went back to see Connie Booth. <laughs> yeah. She's gorgeous. Yeah, he really liked her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they started like... His first proper relationship. Yeah. So then he suddenly gets an audition for Half a Sixpence, yeah, which is, so is a funny. musical. So he's not going to get that. He goes to the audition almost for a laugh, it seems, and he does the acting bit, and they say, great. Then they say, right, now do your song. He's like, ha-ha, I don't have a song, I can't sing. <laughs> they basically think he's hilarious. Yeah. And he's nailed the audition without having to sing, yeah. even though it's for a musical. Yeah. And he says, I can't sing, and they laugh. Then they go, well, what how about a dance? He goes, I can't dance. <laughs> and they laugh and give him the part. Yes. But he wasn't lying. <laughs> yeah, because he says when he turns up first day of rehearsals and the musical director comes over to him and John Cleese says, I can't sing. And the musical director says, oh, don't worry, everybody can sing. And then John Cleese like, sings a couple of notes. And the director laughs at him because he thinks that he's joking. <laughs> and then he finds out he is and he says just get on stage and mime <laughs> makes sense <laughs> he's only in the big chorus numbers anyway <laughs> so it means he's hardly got anything to do and he earns a nice wage from that 200 pounds a week yeah great for six months brilliant touring to new york well they're in new york to boston and toronto then back to broadway yeah and he really enjoys these places he gets yeah. a lot out of it that's a, that's a really good job um, and then he's getting more writing work on a couple of magazines and newspapers. Mm. Um, and then him and Connie move in together because he's over in America for longer now. Yeah. He he's meets a... Terry Gilliam, who asks him if he could do some comic faces for a photo shoot. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's the first time they met. He's seen him in the review and he's good at comic faces. So. Yeah, for like this photo story where he falls in love with a... Barbie doll or something. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's how they meet. Right, so yeah, he sacked himself from his journalist job on the Friday and on the Monday he got a new job writing a satirical sketch show mm -hmm. and it had Peter Cook in it. And that's when they meet properly. Mm -hmm. They're all on the same circuit. It's a small circuit. Well, Peter Cook is footlights as well, isn't he? Yeah. So, But they weren't the same time. No. But Peter Cook and Dudley Moore are his heroes. Rightly so, because they're geniuses. What? So he's still in America, yeah. but he gets a phone call from David Frost. Yes. What does he say? Come back. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, work on my show. He wants him to write for his show, basically, The Frost Report, mm -hmm. which is legendary and the best job ever. So he's back in a flash. He's got the two Ronnies are oh, involved. Oh, yeah. I Ronnie love Corbett and Ronnie Ronnies. Barker, yeah. who are amazing. And five of the Monty Pythons of the future, before they knew it, which are John Cleese, obviously, Eric Idle, Graham Chapman, Terry Gilliam and... Michael Palin. Michael Palin! I have to say, this is how little I knew about Monty Python. I didn't even know who Graham Chapman was. Oh. And when I first was reading his name in this book, I didn't know he was part of Monty Python. Oh, he's the pipe-smoking one. Yeah. No, I know that now. <laughs> But I knew all the others, so it's weird. Well, he died, didn't he? He died young, so he didn't have that career that everyone else had. Yeah, we know them after the fact. Yeah. When they yes. were Monty Python, they were known as Monty Python, but when they did work after, that's how when we got to know their names. Yeah, all and of them had really strong careers, all in different directions. Apart after from Graham Chapman. Python. Apart from Graham Chapman, who died. But he didn't die until 1989. So what was he doing in the 80s? Don't know. Maybe he was writing. Right, yeah, no, but of course. Not Which is more undercover. Yeah. Basically, now he's writing for The Frost Report and they're doing lots of different shows and they're writing and they're still performing and they're doing shows in theatres. Yeah. It's just he's hit a patch where for the next few years he's in constant employment yes. of either performing himself or writing for other established performers yes. and shows. Oh, Marty Feldman. Yeah. I didn't know he was English. Oh, <laughs> that's weird. Did you? Yeah, I don't know much about him. I know his face more than anything else. Yeah, well, he has very a very distinctive, distinctive face. <laughs> he says he looks like an Armenian gargoyle. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea he was English, and I certainly had zero idea that he was involved with John Cleese and everybody and right. David Frost back How do you in the know day. Him? From being in, what's a Frankenstein movie? <laughs> oh, is he in that? Where he's playing Eagle. Ah. And, just from American comedy right. films. I oh. really, I genuinely thought he was an American actor. Right. Yeah. Huh. So Connie Booth it all mixed is up. American, yeah. but Marty Feldman 
is English. Yeah, yeah I find that weird. <laughs> and again, they say that Marty Feldman wasn't a natural performer to begin no, with. No, not at all. But they included but, him in the sketches. Yeah. And they would rehearse with him. Then, like you say, learning on the job, he became a brilliant performer because he's so distinctive. What a perfect character actor, you know? Yeah. So they were all working together on this show called The 1948 Show. I love the um, title they gave that show. They said it was because things took so long in production or for any of the producers yeah. to green light it. They called it, it the 1948. Yeah, 20 years <laughs> later. Yeah. Oh, but all of those tapes of that show, they don't exist anymore. Yeah, they wiped them to save tape. Yeah, and also because the tapes were so big and clumsy yeah. and expensive. Shelf space. Yeah, so to keep shelves, so they would throw them away or they would record over them. Yeah. And he says it's not just like their shows, it was stuff by Alan Bennett, Peter Some Cook Hancocks. and Dudley Moore. I, I knew this, I knew this. Completely gone. But then they also said that's why they discouraged editing so much because you actually slice the yeah. film and sellotape it up. Yeah. They didn't want to damage it in case they wanted to reuse it. Wow. Oh, he talks a lot about when they had to film these sketches live because it was all live, like once a week, and the Frost Report became three times a week. He really describes the studio audience, and sometimes they didn't laugh at all and how it just felt like they were dying on their feet. Other times they laugh at absolutely nothing. Yes. They're like, what are we doing? That wasn't even <laughs> funny. But just the pressure. That's why he sometimes talks about certain times being the happiest time of his life because the more his success builds up, the more pressure and stress he feels. You can see why. Yeah. Live bloody TV. Yeah. And doing monologues and trying to memorise these lines and deliver them, you know, the stress of it. There's a whole passage in this book where he actually flips between what the monologue is and what he was thinking over it. Like, oh, my God, my mum and dad are watching this at home. And he's in the middle of this rant and then he's going, my Aunt Vera might be watching. I wonder what they're thinking. What are they having for tea? And how part of your brain goes on robot because he's learned this script. Yeah. Because you can do that, yeah. but it's horrible. <laughs> I, I'd never want to be an actor. <laughs> it's horrendous. Stress. Oh, I thought it was amazing when he's talking about Peter Sellers and he says that he could just listen to somebody and within about 10 minutes he could completely recreate them. Yeah. And then remember that for sketches months away mm -hmm. or whatever. And at some point, they went round in the morning to write at his house, and he'd only just woken up, he'd overslept, and he came out in his dressing gown, just woken up, and he talked like an upper-class person. Then he talked like a Cockney person, and finally he found his own voice. Yes. It took him a while to process who That's he really bizarre. was. Yeah, so he like he does it so often but, and so well. But he, you... Yeah, it takes you a while to come round. To figure out who you are in the character. morning. I mean, that sounds a bit crazy, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, he did say he's a genius, and I think even the word genius is always a bit loaded, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like... A heavy burden to bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was bizarre. Yeah, it's fascinating. So they're writing like a film script for Peter Sellers. Yeah. And they said they learnt so much from him, yeah. actually. And he said the real difference between like a TV producer or a film producer who would want you to do a script they'll take a draft of the script into the film producer who've never written comedy in their life and they'll tell them everything that's wrong with it and why it's not funny. But then you go with Peter Sellers, somebody whose whole life has been immersed in comedy and he'll just really help you hone your script so it's the best that it can be. Yeah, they had a really good time working yeah. with Peter Sellers. Learning from the best. Yeah. He'd roar with laughter at some of their things. And you get that a lot as well with John Cleese, with Graham Chapman, that when they hit on something funny... And he said it wasn't even laughing. They'd howl, bang yeah. their feet, slap things. <laughs> Just this real sense of what's funny that they all shared. That's what all these people shared. I mean, I know that seems obvious when they were comedy writers, but they just love Oh, they I love it. Yeah, I think it's like, especially when you're a troupe like Monty Python, to create that kind of comedy, you just have to click in a way that the Spice Girls had a couple of iterations with different girls, yes. which didn't quite work. And actually, then when they get the five the who right become the Spice Girls, it's together. the right combination yeah. of people. It's true. And that's got to be the same for comedy. Yeah. And there's this little network, though, where they can shift around. There's a bigger group yes. of the right people. And they yeah. can shift around. Sometimes Michael Paley's with Eric Idle over yeah. there and they're over there. Well, of course, this is all at the same time. And they quite often work with Bill Oddy. Tim Brooke Taylor yes. and Graham Garden, who, of course, become the goodies. Yes. I had no idea that the goodies and Monty Python, they'd all interact. Crossed over, lived together, together yeah. everything. Yeah. No idea. 
And yeah, all being there at the same time as the two Ronnies. Yeah, and... oh, well, he's got so much admiration for Ronnie Corbett. And Ronnie says, Barker. He says he makes it look so easy. They were brilliant. They were brilliant. It yeah. does make me want to watch a lot more of this yeah. stuff. Yeah, oh, do you know what? I kind of, because I, like I said, I'd never really been into Monty Python. A few of the scripts are in yeah. this book. And oh my God, they really made me laugh. And it does make me think, so like now, yeah. uh, well, as soon as we finish recording this, because I haven't had time, because I've been reading yeah. the book and now I'm recording it, I'm going to watch some Monty Python me too. tonight. There's a lot of sketches in this book actually which is a real treat they're saying that when they're writing this stuff for tv there's a certain expectation it's a bit more conservative what the people expect of comedy and they want to go more surreal oh my god they have to rein it in a bit yeah they can't be too mad there's never been anything like this on tv before and in fact they will put on who was it david frost let them stay a bit offbeat and crazy because he knew they had a later TV slot. This wasn't going yes. out of primetime TV, so he could allow them to do it. It didn't have to be family friendly and mainstream. So they just became this popular niche comedy. The people who loved them would find them and watch later. But yeah, they were certainly, this wasn't mainstream comedy. No. It kind of still isn't really. I mean, I know a lot of people now, I guess, like the League of Gentlemen and stuff, you know, because of Monty Python's influence. But certainly at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, it was just bizarre. Yeah. I can imagine a lot of people watching it thinking, what the hell is Yeah, this? yeah. John Cleese was in The Avengers. I know. Have you seen it? Yes, I saw that episode when he's got the little clowns on eggs. The clowns on eggs, right? That's like a way that clowns used to trademark their makeup. Yeah. They'd paint it on an egg. So are they all stored somewhere? I don't know. It's like pantomime dames well, in how, Britain. Yeah. Every single pantomime dame has their own makeup and it's trademarked. Not, Is it? Not, I don't think it's officially trademarked, but every pantomime dame designs their own face makeup and yeah. then that's it forever. Is it? And you can't copy anyone else's. Do they I paint it on an egg? I wonder if they do. <laughs> <laughs> they all still exist somewhere, those eggs, you know. That's amazing. I'm fascinated by that. Let's find those eggs. Yeah, let's go and find those <laughs> eggs. <laughs> <laughs> they went to have a meeting with the head of programming. This is the Python gang, basically, because they decided they should all work together. Mm-hmm. We should make a programme, they went. The bloke said, OK, what is it? Expecting a pitch. And they hadn't thought that through at all. They were like, oh, um, they only wanted to say we need to make a programme. What? Does it have music? Does it have... Ah, like, oh, <laughs> how humiliating. They hadn't <laughs> even got round to talking about what it would be like. <laughs> And they're thinking they'd have to go away really embarrassed. Blokes went, all right, there's however much money, go and make 13 shows. And they did with completely no boundaries at all. Was that called Do Not Adjust Your Set? No, that was from watching that, that was a kid's show and they and it was Eric Idle oh, and Michael yes, Palin. Yes, yes. John Cleese and Graham Chapman thought we should work with them. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that was Terry Gilliam's earliest animation on that kid's show. Yeah, so yeah. they got them, they all agreed. Then they went for that meeting, the bloke went, go and make the programme. So they all sat down and had to thrash out what a show that they all did might be like. And they bloody invented Monty Python's flying <laughs> Circus. It's so cool, and it this really comes at the end of the book, doesn't it? Yeah. The beginning of them comes at the end of the book. Yeah, and do you know what? That's my one frustrating thing about this book, is as I was getting to the end of it, I was thinking, oh, come on, he hasn't really talked about yeah. Monty Python or Faulty Towers Hello. or Clockwise or A Fish Called Wonder. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. And I was thought there's not that many pages left. I know. I think, like I say, I think everything you need to know about it is in the work. Yeah. I think we need to go and watch the work now. But still, as a fan, or even not as yes, a, a you fan, want you, want, know you want to know about it. Of course you do. Biographies are for that, not autos. Really? Yeah, because you're getting in the mind. I don't know. I'm just trying to defend him because I love <laughs> this book. Did you? Did you yeah, it? I thought it was hilarious. And I love that actually that it ends off with their reunion at the yeah, O2 which was in 2014 already already oh ages God, ago yeah. my mate made the parrot I've got to say that oh really yeah how ah, cool is that that is very cool and lots cool. of other props that would go parrot. that would go at the top of my CV yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting about the shows they only came about because well we haven't talked about Spamalot the musical because John Cleese doesn't talk about Spamalot the musical because there's nothing to do with him anyway I think it was Eric Idle who oh, okay. was in control of that but one of the producers of the film it was based on which is Monty Python and the Holy Grail sued them for a share of the profits he said that he should get what the Pythons were yeah, getting yeah and they got legal costs in, in the area of £800,000 that's ridiculous and then they thought, oh, 
how are they going to raise that money? I mean, I'm sure they've got it, haven't I'm they? I'm sure they've got it, but it, <laughs> it probably annoyed them to have to part with it. Yeah, so the shows came out of a need yeah. to raise this it's money for the legal fees. A days. show on. A show, fee. one show at the O2, and it sold out in 45 seconds. Yeah, so they put on three more, and they sold out in yeah. a couple of hours, so they ended up doing 10 shows. Amazing. At the O2 in London, which is 16,000 people at a time. And then they all got together and went, Okay, right, let's put it together. And they went, oh, no, everyone's busy. This is my joke, right? I've written a joke. Terry Gilliam was film directing. John Cleese was writing this very book. Michael Palin was travelling all around the world. Eric was idle. (laughs) Hey! There you go. (laughs) So he put the show together. Right, yeah. Yeah, because he had Mm -hmm. the spare time. Well, first of all, he put the running orders together and they all loved it. And And he said, well, look, do you want me to just put the whole thing together and direct it? And it was a triumph. Yeah, it really was. Did you go? I didn't go. I went to the cinema to see it live. Did you? Yeah. And how was it? It was great. I was just so proud of my friend making the parrot. <laughs> That's the main reason I went. No, but it was absolutely great. They did lots of the famous sketches and it was all interspersed. They had a bit of music, like spam a lot and everything, uh-huh. bits of this and that. Yeah, it was cracking. They're, they've still got it. There was only four of them when well, Graham Chapman dead. died. Was there only ever five? Yeah, I think so. It feels like more. Hang on. So Graham Chapman, John Cleese, Eric Idle, Michael Palin, Terry Gilliam. Yeah. And Terry Jones. Yeah, I doubt Terry Jones is in there, but maybe he wasn't. He's he's around a lot in this whole world. I thought there was five. Maybe there were six. Yeah, well, Why do we not know this now? after reading this whole book? <laughs> because they're all, su- they're all such yeah. an indispensable gang. No, they really are. They yeah. went here, there and everywhere, yeah. but um, Yeah, so I have changed my opinion of John Cleese. He's not who I thought he was. It's weird that I thought somebody who's so funny, I thought he was so morose and miserable, is just more of an intelligent, thinking man who just loves comedy. That's how I see him now. Different. He does say, because I'd heard that Monty Python really fell out, and he would talk about it in the book, about actually it wasn't all of them that would fall out. It was mainly John Cleese and I think Terry Jones. And he said it was never personal. They no. weren't falling out personally. They were falling creative out about yeah, create, being yeah. creative and not agreeing on yes. how certain things uh, said, should be written. Actually, that's how you really create. He also <laughs> says that the Cambridge lot and the Oxford lot, they had different sort of brains because the Cambridge lot were more logical and the Oxford gang were a bit more visual. They were just coming at it from a different angle. But you put them together, and when it works, boom. Oh, yeah. I've always felt like I should have known Monty Python more. And I knew that people who really loved it, really loved it. Mm. And this book, like, I would never have read this book had you not found it in the charity shop. I, re- I loved the book. It was just so funny. Like, it was making me laugh yeah, out loud. Yeah. And because of this book now... I am actively, when we finish recording this, I am actively going to go and watch some Monty Python. Yeah, yeah. Because I think I'm probably going to love it. Yeah, you're right. It was on telly when we were probably quite young and it might have been a I, bit before too we hard were, for it us. It was before we were born. No, no, I know, but it was oh, repeated. Repeat, like, sorry, yeah. 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 And that Faulty Towers was. Yeah, but that's, but that's so just much so more accessible. funny, yeah. yeah. That, I hilarious. think the thing about there being like only 12 episodes, and but I have watched those episodes yeah. like 25 times yes. over. In fact, I have the DVDs upstairs. Do you? Yeah. Well, I've lived it, haven't I? We had a hotel oh in Torquay. Oh, my God. You... And my dad is Basil Faulty. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, that's and, we, and we had a Spanish waiter. Did you? Yes. <laughs> Are you sure John Cleese didn't come and observe you? I your... cannot be sure. No, we we were copying him. <laughs> and also, don't forget, it's so different now. Like Monty Python, when that was just on TV, when that programme finished, it was gone. You couldn't watch it again unless it was repeated right. on TV. And that's the same for Faulty Towers. As if they hadn't wiped the tape. Yeah. Well, actually, he does talk about this comedy record you used to get. Oh, yeah. And they'd get... Them, dissect them. I used to have a not only but also with Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. So rude. Yes. Absolutely weepingly hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so you love this book, right? Loved it. it. Does a little part of you want to read Eric Idle and see from another angle? Yeah. I could uh, read all of them. Well, we probably will end up reading all yeah, of them. Yeah, and it's so amazing because someone like Terry Gilliam, to be honest, all of them. I mean, Michael Palin went all around the world many, many, many times and wrote whole diaries about all of his travels and his programmes are great and he's such a lovely, lovely man. And Terry Gilliam has got this wacky brain, completely mm. mad. And like, 
and visual and some of his films, Brazil, can you name yeah, another one? Yeah. Did he do Around the World Next Time Day? Time Bandits. Like Time Bandits, that's what I'm thinking of, isn't it? Oh, so visually creative and crazy, but I guess that's the similarity to his animations. But mm-hmm. And then Eric Idle with his music, always look on the bright side of life. He's very music. It's all the elements. Yeah. John Cleese with all of his everything he did, which is tons of other stuff. Yeah, they're so I could you could read all of them. They're all very different lives that converge at certain points and yes. then go off and are completely yeah. different. Yeah. And now for something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing an interview at some point where John Cleese said that he they were touring with Monty Python and he didn't want to stay in the hotel that everyone else was in. So he checked himself out, they were in Torquay. And he took himself to this random hotel that called the Glen Eagles, which was just a bit nearer the seaside. I know exactly where it is because it still existed when I lived there. I don't know if it's still there. But the man who ran it was another person who'd been in World War Two. You know, another complete nut job casualty of war. And he was really disciplinary. So he's like, you have to be in by half past ten. So I'm looking <laughs> at the door. He's like, I can't be in by half past ten. I'm in a show. So he's constantly banging on the door and causing havoc. This bloke, another guest said, somebody's suitcase was left in the lobby and it was ticking. So he taken it out, run down to the cliff and thrown it over the cliff into the sea, thinking it's a bomb. It was his alarm clock. (laughs) Because he's, you know, lost his mind from war. But he was, he stayed there the whole time because he couldn't get enough of this man. And he absorbed it all, and he wrote Faulty Towers wow. while he was there. Wow. He just knocked it out. And see, that's a really good story. That should be in this book. It should be in this book. But I knew that, so there you go. Now you know it. Now I know it, but why is it not in there? I, I just find it weird. I know, because been. there's lots of little stories like that. No, there is. Look, Maybe he's got so many, he couldn't... No, I know. Mind. I loved this book, and it made me laugh so much. But come on, John Cleese, just put a little bit about 40 Towers yeah. in the book. Well, there you go. I've put it in. All right, great. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I just think the stupidest thing John Cleese ever did yeah. was not change his name back to Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so funny. Yeah. John Cheese. But he has outed himself in this book. He has a, what? Outed uh, himself. Yeah. Very carefully. Hey! Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thrift Shop Biography. We love making this podcast and we're absolutely thrilled that so many of you are already listening. Um, We're new to this and you could really help us out by leaving us a review somewhere, wherever you listen to this podcast. And if you could share us, tell your friends about us or drop some links on social media. We have a Facebook page called Thrift Shop Biography. So make sure you come over there to hear about the episodes first and what else we're up to. Okay, see you next week. And if you're new here, there are loads more episodes now to go and listen in the back catalogue. So make sure you go and enjoy them. Okay, thank you very much.